be glorified. This is an uh, interesting topic for me because um, one of the most common criticisms we hear from Muslims is that Christianity has been corrupted and that Christianity has been influenced by paganism and that Christian beliefs uh, have been, uh, when, when Muslims say that Christianity was corrupted, so Jesus was given a message and then later on people corrupted it, they often say that it was corrupted by paganism. So the pagans, the various Greeks and their beliefs influenced Christianity. Now this is absolute nonsense. The Christians were horribly persecuted for centuries because they refused to compromise in any way with paganism. And all the beliefs that you can point to Christianity and say, aha, you got that from paganism, actually those beliefs are prophesied in the Old Testament. So there's no way these things came from paganism. But what's more interesting about this is that when we examine Islam, it's Islam that has been incredibly influenced by paganism, and Muslims don't even realize it. Muslims think that when they bow down towards the Kaaba, that they're doing something that is thoroughly Islamic. No, you're not. That was a pagan temple before it, was anything, it had anything to do with monotheism. Uh, when Muslims uh, fast during the month of Ramadan, or take the pilgrimage to Mecca, or kiss the black stone, they're thinking that they're doing something uh, monotheistic and Islamic. No, these are all pagan practices. And what we find, if we examine the evidence objectively, is that pretty much everything, pretty much everything that was a part of 7th century culture has been incorporated into Islam, but these, this, was, this was a pagan world. I mean, just, just, uh, just to give you an example here, uh, think of, let's say, 15th century Japan, 15th century Japanese culture, the way they dressed, uh, the way they talked, the way they acted. Uh, now, suppose people in 15th century Japanese culture came to believe that a prophet arose among them, and these uh, Japanese uh, religious believers went out spreading their religion, and they tried to spread uh, 15th century Japanese culture wherever they went. So everyone had to wear Japanese robes, and everyone had to speak Japanese, and you had to read the holy book in Japanese. Japanese was the holy language of God. Uh, what would you think? Would, would, this not be, would this not be absurd? And yet that's exactly what we find in Islam. It's 7th century Arabian culture, 7th, uh, 7th century Arabian practices, most of them pagan practices, and this has been incorporated into the very fabric of Islam. And we just want you Muslims to realize where these practices come from. When you bow down to that Kaaba, we want you to know that was a pagan practice. Every time you bow down and face Mecca, we want you to understand that was a pagan practice. That's what the pagan polytheists of Mecca did. When you take the pilgrimage, when you go on the Hajj, when you kiss the black stone, when you walk around the Kaaba, seven to, these were pagan practices. How can this not bother you? And then how can you be so hypocritical and point to Christianity and say, Christianity was influenced by paganism, when it, it hasn't been in any way. So this is what we want to lay out today, but don't take our word for it when we say that Islam has been influenced by paganism. We'll show you from your own sources. We'll show you from history that Islam has been influenced by paganism. So, Sam, you want to uh, give them some yeah. Do we have evidence? time or do we have a call? Yes. Yeah, yeah. No. All right. No, well, well, yeah. Okay. We just want to let the people understand what we're yeah, the topic to do about tonight. Yeah. tonight. Yes. Um, uh, people who have been watching the show, uh, show know it's my habit just to invoke uh, the God and Father of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray that the Father of the Lord Jesus will just clothe us with his love, with his presence, with his Holy Spirit. And I pray that for all of us. And I pray in Jesus' name that the Father enables us to speak the truth clearly and passionately without compromise, but to do it in a spirit of love. His love for the Muslims flowing through us so that Muslims will know, although that we're discussing tough issues, our intention is not to attack you or to degrade you or humiliate you or debase you. That's what the Quran commands you to do to us. The reason why we are criticizing Islam uh, is because we love you enough that we want you to know the truth so that you can fall in love with Jesus Christ. Come to know Jesus and be washed in His blood and born of His Spirit, the Spirit of His Father, so that you can receive eternal life as a free gift because of what Jesus did. And I pray that the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, will enable us to accomplish that uh, task, glorifying Him and winning Muslims uh, for His Lordship, I pray in Jesus' name. With that said, uh, <clears throat> I just want to read some narratives, uh, traditions attributed to Muhammad, Traditions that are deemed to be authentic uh, without dispute. Uh, Brother David said that the Kaaba is a pagan shrine. <clears throat> it's a, a pagan temple. 
In fact, the Hadiths say that during the lifetime of Muhammad, there were at least 360 idols that were found in this pagan shrine. 360 idols of the pagans that worshipped at, at the shrine in honor of these gods. Now let me read the narration. This comes from Sahil Bukhari. Sahil Bukhari deemed to be the most authentic collection of narrations, beyond any dispute. Uh, volume 6, <clears throat> Book 60, number 244. Now Muslims, please pay attention to what I'm about to read and the implications that I'm going to draw from these narratives. Narrated Abdullah ibn Masood, Volume 6, Book 60, number 244. Narrated Abdullah ibn Masood, Allah's Apostle entered Mecca in the year of conquest, the year he conquered Mecca, and there were 360 idols around the Kaaba. Here it says around the Kaaba, the pagan shrine. He then started hitting them with a the stick in his hand and said, Truth, i.e. Islam, has come. And falsehood, disbelief, has vanished, meaning the falsehood of paganism. As we will see, Islam retains much of, its, uh, uh, much of the pagan practices of those who were living there before the time of Muhammad and during his time. Truly, falsehood is ever bound to vanish. Truth has come, and falsehood cannot create anything. So according to this narration, when Muhammad conquered Mecca, there are at least 360 idols surrounding the Kaaba. Now, why is that significant? <clears throat> that means prior to the time, prior to that moment when Muhammad eradicated these idols, Muhammad was steeped in paganism. Remember, according to Muslim sources, uh, he belonged to the Quraysh tribe. The Quraysh tribe were pagans, even admitted by Muslim sources, and they worshipped these 360 idols. And what's interesting is that according to the sources, when Muhammad supposedly received revelation from Jibreel, Gabriel, this took place during the month of Ramadan. According to Sal Bukhari, volume 1, number 3, Muhammad, it was his custom that during the month of Ramadan would go to the higher caves, the higher mountains in, in, in Arabia, and he would meditate. And during this time of meditation and contemplation, the spirit came, and the spirit later identified himself as Gabriel. Now, why is that, uh, why is that important? Because that tells you that even the fasting month of Ramadan was something being observed by the Arabs long before Muhammad claimed to be a prophet. So I want the Muslims to understand the implication of these statements and these sources. Muhammad, before he claimed to be a prophet, was observing the month of Ramadan. In fact, it was during this month that Gabriel supposedly came to, uh, to Muhammad. So the fast of Ramadan was a pagan fast. According to these sources, there were pagan idols, idols erected by the pagans, uh, around the Kaaba, and according to one source specifically, Muhammad would run around the Kaaba as these 360 idols were around it. Let me read the source. This comes from Sirat Rasulullah. Sirat Rasulullah, and it's available in English, translated by er Alfred Goleme. Uh, it's a French, how do you pronounce the last name? Guillaume. Guillaume, all right. French last French. name, man, I don't know. Spelled Guleme, but he says Guillaume. All right, Alfred Guillaume translated Sirat Rasulullah. It's the oldest extant biography on the life of Muhammad, which was edited by Ibn Hisham. It was written down by Ibn Ishaq, edited by Ibn Hisham, translated in English by Alfred Guillaume. This comes from the English translation, Life of Muhammad, page 170. Now let me read this quotation. When the Apostle of God had finished his period of seclusion, when he would go to the higher caves and meditate during the, the month of Ramadan, the fasting month that Muslims till this day observe, he returned to Mecca. In the first place, he performed the circum, uh, circumambulation of the Kaaba, the running around the Kaaba that the Muslims do till this day when they perform Hajj or Umrah, as was his wont, meaning his practice. While he was doing it, Waraka met him and said, O son of my brother, tell me what thou hast seen and heard. Notice what this is saying that after his encounter with the spirit who identified himself as Gabriel, Muhammad returned to, to Mecca, ran around the Kaaba during the time in which there were still 360 idols. Now, why would the prophet of monotheism, the prophet who supposedly brought the strictest form of monotheism known, why would he observe the practice of running around the Kaaba when it was littered with idols? 360 to be exact. And we'll find that later on, when he went to Medina, he did it again. When he performed Umrah, he again ran around the Kaaba when the idols were still in place. Why is he observing such practices when this house is littered with idols, an abomination to the true God? Now, before I move on to 
my next point, do we... I have a question for okay. you guys. Okay, uh, It's been said when Islam came, they cleaned the Kaaba from all of these uh, idols that was inside. That's what I just read, yes. <clears throat> all right. And uh, the other one, from where this black stone came? It's a meteorite or it really came from heaven for Abraham to build a temple on it there? Can you... Elaborate on that. On yes. Um, as far as the yes. the uh, cleansing of the Kaaba, uh, yes, Muhammad smashed the uh, the idols that were there, with the exception. And Jesus was there too. <laughs> oh, you <laughs> mean the picture? I the know picture. Yes. Yeah. He's talking about a portrait of Jesus yeah. and Abraham. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. Um, as far as the cleansing of the temple, though, it's it's very uh, it's very important to recognize that uh, originally Muslims prayed facing Jerusalem. Precisely. Uh, but Muhammad would visit the Kaaba. Muhammad would visit the Kaaba regularly, even as a Muslim, when, it w when he was a persecuted prophet in Mecca. So Muhammad is in Mecca. He has no control. There are still the 360 idols there. Muhammad visits this pagan shrine regularly and kisses the black stone. Interestingly, later on, when the Jews rejected Muhammad and they understood the Torah enough to realize that he's a false prophet, uh, Muhammad turned away from Jerusalem as, uh, as the direction that Muslims should pray to and turned facing the Kaaba in Mecca. So for several years, for several years before Muslims conquer, before Muslims conquer Mecca and destroy the idols, Muslims are bowing down and facing a house of worship that is filled with 360 pagan idols. Now, just imagine this. The, the prophet of monotheism comes along and says, you want to know where we're going to pray to? We're going to pray facing those 360 pagan idols. Why would you do that? Because that was what the pagans did. That's what Muhammad had been raised to do. That's what the vast majority of his followers had been raised to do. They had been raised to bow down to these 360 idols. And they were very comfortable doing this. This seemed natural to them. Abu Bakr, all of the early, uh, all of the early uh, Muslim converts from Mecca uh, would have grown up bowing down to this pagan temple. And that's exactly what, what Muhammad did for a period of several years. While it, was still, while it was still surrounded with pagan idols, Muslims are bowing down to it. Now, as far as, uh, as, far as the black stone, yes, this does seem to be some sort of meteorite. It's, it's interesting to note that other places around the world, when, when, when a meteorite would fall to earth, they would take this up as an object of veneration and worship. In ancient Ephesus, in ancient, Ephes in ancient Ephesus, they were known to have a meteorite. They were known to have a meteorite, uh, mm -hmm. which, was, which became an object of reverence and worship. I'm sure Sam can go into uh, more detail on, on actual sources on what <clears throat> we read about the black stone. Uh, but there's no question. There, Muslims, what are you doing? You're going to smash every idol except for this black stone, which was this, was, this was a pagan object. This is what the pagan, this fell from heaven for us. That's what the pagans believed. Other pagan groups in the ancient world believed the same thing about it. And interestingly enough, even the early Muslims recognized that there was something very, very wrong about this. Umar, the second rightly guided caliph, said to the black stone, he said, I, you can't do anything. If, I would never, ever, 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 ever kiss this black stone, this object of paganism, but for the fact that I saw Muhammad doing it. So early Muslims, even the rightly guided, one of the rightly guided caliphs recognize this object is associated with paganism. There's no way I'm going to go over there and kiss it the way the pagans are doing it. I'm not going to adopt this pagan practice, but I have to. Because according to Surah 33, 21, Muhammad is the example that all Muslims should follow. Therefore, if Muhammad is kissing this uh, object of pagan idolatry just the way the pagans were doing, then I'm going to do it too. And Muslims to this day, when they, when they, when they visit Mecca, will do everything, everything they can to get close enough to the black stone to kiss it. Why? Because Muhammad did. Why did Muhammad do it? Because he grew up in the Quraysh tribe and that was what they did. That's what the pagans of Mecca did. This seemed very natural to them and now it's a part of Islam. So again, what you, Muslims, what, what do you do? What do you do when you're pointing a finger at Christianity saying it's been corrupted by paganism and it hasn't? And yet when we turn to your religion, we look at almost every single practice you have. Almost every single practice in your religion comes directly from the pagans. How can this not bother you? How, how can this not bother you? If I had a practice that was part of my religion 
And I immediately saw, oh, wait a minute, this was a pagan practice that was adopted by someone in my religion. I would be horrified. I would be horrified. And in Islam, it's not just one. It's not two. It's not three. It's not four. It's not five. It's almost everything you do as part of your religion was a pagan practice or a pagan belief. How can this not bother you? I don't know. Okay, I uh, have another uh, question. It, it could be a kind of compromise with Muhammad and the tribe of Quraysh to make that reconciliation that they kept the Kaaba and is there is anything has to do with the moon or the crescent that there was people are worshiping that uh, god of the moon or those eras. Uh, before we get into the moon, uh, the moon god, whether Allah was a moon god, mm. uh, I just want to understand your question. Are you asking that Muhammad compromise with them? No, yeah. yes. Uh, uh, what he's asking yeah. because he made a uh, reconciliation with his tribe when he came back and they yeah when he conquered this them? big sheet and they uh, tried to uh, maybe he said okay I'm gonna keep this Kaaba but let's clean it up and yeah I, I don't think clean it's it for the new yeah, god I wouldn't I, I wouldn't I don't think he did mm -hmm. it because he was trying to compromise with oh, them because man, I gotta, well, we're, we're gonna have a debate <laughs> on screen here uh, I, well, no, because if you let me finish my okay, point, okay. All right. uh, I, I thought you were on my side, but oh, you see, no, this is what happens when it's life. Okay. Uh, what, uh, because he had them under his control, he had already subjugated them. So if the purpose was to compromise, to appease them, mm -hmm. well, at this point in time, he has the power and he subjugated them and they're under his control. Mm -hmm. I, I actually think it's because uh, uh, he grew up steeped in these practices and that he, he adopted as part of his religion. So it... I'm sure Dave is going to say that to compromise and to bring them in union with him, but he had already controlled them, subjugated them, and dominated them at the point that you're talking about. Because you're mm -hmm. saying when he came and he wanted to appease them. Well, even before, before that, he's already observing these practices. And the reason why I say it's significant for this so-called prophet of monotheism, for him to be running around the Kaaba at a time in which there are three, three, uh, still 360 idols, is that there's a tradition. Now, I don't believe this tradition is true historically but it's reported in the Muslim sources. The same Ibn Ishaq reports that the Jews were telling the king of, mm -hmm. uh, the Yemeni king, the mm -hmm. king of the Yemenites, that this Kaaba supposedly was erected by their father Abraham. Now, I don't believe this episode happened. Be that as it may, it's recorded in this, this source that Muslims believe uh, contains reliable tradition. Mm -hmm. Not completely reliable, they'll question some of the traditions, but I want to read the part that's significant in showing that the Jews uh, if this is a true report, that the Jews are more, more conscious of the worship of the one God than Muhammad himself. And here's why. I'm just going to read it so you can see why it's so significant that what Muhammad did was a violation of monotheism. Because Muslims keep saying that Islam is the purest form of monotheism and worship sh should, be, uh, should be given to Allah alone. You shouldn't mix it with paganism. But let's see what the Jews told, or supposedly told, the Yemeni king. Let me read this. This comes from the life of Muhammad, translation of Sirat Rasulullah. And in the English translation, it's pages 8 to 9. It says, they, the rabbis, uh, uh, told that the sole object of the tribe was to destroy him and his army, talking about the tribe in, in Mecca. We know of no other temple in the land, this is the Jew supposedly saying this, which God has chosen for himself, uh, that's said they, and if you do what they suggest, you and all your men will perish. The king asked them what he should do when he got there, and they told him to do what the people of Mecca did. Circum, uh, circumambulate the temple, run around the temple to venerate and honor it, to shave his head and to behave with all humility until he had left its precincts. Then the king asked, and a very smart uh, question, by the way. The king asked why they didn't do likewise. Okay, the Jews are telling the king, when you get to Mecca, don't destroy it. Run around the Kaaba, you know, honor its customs because this is a house of God, supposedly. So then the king asked these Jews, okay, then why don't you do it? If you believe this is the house of God, it was erected by your father Abraham, how come you don't go there and honor the customs and run around it? Now notice the response given by the Jews. They replied that it was indeed the temple of their father Abraham, but the idols which the inhabitants had set up around it and the blood which they shed there presented an insuperable obstacle. They are unclean polytheists, they said, or words to that effect. The Jews refused to run around the Kaaba because there were idols still at the Kaaba at this time. And yet, I just read a tradition that said Muhammad ran around the Kaaba when there were still 360 idols around it. So how can you say that Muhammad brought the purest form of monotheism when we see that early in his career, he had no reticence running around the Kaaba littered with idols? 
So again, and then maybe Dave, you want to comment on what he was yes, saying, on, his question. Uh, I wanted to comment on the, the compromise. Actually, Sam and I aren't, aren't too much in disagreement. We're thinking of compromise in two different senses. Right. Uh, Sam was thinking of compromise as, uh, hey, I want to make a compromise with these guys to, to end this dispute between us. I was thinking of, of compromise just in the sense that uh, Muhammad had a desire, a deep down desire, uh, to win these people over, and that this influenced the revelations yeah. that he was, uh, that he was, uh, re he believed he was receiving from God. Because we know, if we know anything about Muhammad, we know that he was influenced by his desires. When he wanted more than four wives, he got a revelation saying it could have more than four wives. When he wanted to s uh, sleep with his slave girl, and he gave an oath to his wives saying that he wouldn't sleep with his slave girl, he got a revelation from God telling him, go ahead, you can, uh, you can, uh, you can violate this oath to your own wives. When uh, Muhammad wanted the wife of his own adopted son, he got a revelation saying, okay, you can have her. Over and over and over again, Muhammad had a desire, and then this desire would be satisfied by a revelation. And in the next program, we're going to be talking about something uh, uh, that's even more closely related with the satanic verses. The entire uh, uh, the, the source of the satanic verses is that Muhammad desired that the pagans of Mecca, specifically the Quraysh, would join his religion, would submit to Islam. And he longed for a revelation from God that would bring these people to Islam. And then he got the revelation that would do this. It was a revelation promoting, promoting the gods of, uh, of, of the pagans, Allah, Alus, and Manat. So Muhammad desired recon reconciliation with his people so much that it affected the revelations he was getting. So later on, when Muhammad is praying towards Jerusalem, and this is offending his uh, pagan kinsmen, uh, it's not difficult to see how this person who wants reconciliation with these pagan kinsmen who are offended that he's praying towards Jerusalem would say, oh, actually, no, God has changed the direction of prayer, and now we are to pray facing the Kaaba, just like all you pagans whom I was offending by facing Jerusalem. So it's not that Muhammad sits down and says, all right, what can I do? Uh, what can I do here? How can I, how can I make things right between us, and how can I make this less difficult for them? It's that Muhammad has a desire for reconciliation with them, and Muhammad's desires, as we know from all the Muslim sources, Muhammad's desires often, often uh, uh, influence his revelations. And if that offends you, if you think I'm wrong, uh, I would just invite you to, uh, to, to trust Aisha. If you don't trust me, surely, if you're at least a Sunni Muslim, you would trust Aisha, the source of so many narrations about Muhammad, who said... After Muhammad received one of these revelations that satisfied his desires, uh, Aisha said, My, your Lord hastens to satisfy your wishes and desires. Aisha noticed this over a period of years, that every time Muhammad wants something, a revelation comes down saying, Oh, of course you can have that, Muhammad. Uh, you, want, you want the wife of your own adopted son? No problem. You get her. Uh, you want more wives than, than you told everyone else they're allowed to have? No problem. You, you get them. Anything you want, Muhammad, you get. And when we, when we understand that Muhammad's, according to Aisha, not according to me, according to Aisha, uh, Muhammad's revelations were influenced by his desires. Uh, and when we understand that, and we understand that Muhammad had a desire to reconcile with the pagans of Mecca and to bring them uh, into Islam, it's certainly not surprising that he would adopt all the practices of Islam and that these would all get Allah's stamp of approval. After all, Allah put his stamp of approval on all of Muhammad's desires. All right, I uh, have another question for you guys till we get the phone calls right. working here. Uh, Christianity, we would like to be connected to Abraham. Mm -hmm. yes. The Judaism, we are the sons of Abraham. And Islam says, yes, also we are the sons of Abraham. And uh, is there is any documentary that says that Abraham went to the Arabian Peninsula and this was the place that God told him to, to build a temple for his son there in that area, the Kaaba area? No. So short no, answer is no. No, no, no not, Absolutely uh, not no a shred. Absolutely no pre-Islamic evidence. No, right. none whatsoever. If you yeah, uh, and and you know th this is this is something that that's very interesting. According to uh, according to what Muslims believe and what Muslims tell us, uh, you know, there was a line of descendants from Ishmael. You know, it's, it's just like the descendants of 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 uh, through through Isaac that that ultimately became the Jews. And 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 think about think about this though. The Jews are there. They're in a community. They refuse. Uh, to compromise with paganism. Whenever they do compromise with paganism, God punishes them until they come back immediately to belief in the one true God. God is always in a clear relationship with the Jews. And ultimately, the Messiah comes 
uh, comes to the Jews. So there's always a link. They have the genealogies. They can always trace who's related to whom, who goes back uh, to Abraham and so on. Uh, Muslims don't have a shred of evidence, don't have a shred of evidence that Muhammad's connected with, uh, with uh, Ishmael. They don't have any genealogies. They don't have any evidence that they're related to Abraham. They have none of this. So why is that? Why is it that, that the Jewish community that comes through Isaac kept careful records of everything, was very careful uh, to document their genealogies, knew who was related to who, uh, so that they could trace the lineage of Jesus, they could trace the lineage of, of all kinds of people, of David, of everyone, and we get to Islam, and you show me, show me a genealogy of Muhammad that goes back to I Ishmael. You have no evidence. It's, what, what we find in Islam is Muhammad takes all these pagan practices and says, oh, Abraham did it, and I'm, I'm a descendant of Abraham. Well, do you have any evidence for that? Well, I'm a prophet. Uh, well, and anything else, Muhammad? Because that's what we're wondering. We're wondering if you're a prophet. And based on what you're telling us, everything you seem to be adopting, uh, as far as your practices are, are concerned, is a pagan practice. So you can't just say, well, Abraham... Again, again, imagine this. Imagine you, you came to some, you came to some uh, culture. Let's, let's, again, let's say 15th century Japanese culture. And in 15th century Japanese culture, a prophet arises and says, I'm, I'm a true prophet. And you, you say, why are you, why are you f trying to get everyone to agree with, with you and say that, that 15th century Japanese culture is the culture that everyone else has to adopt? Uh, well, I'm a descendant of Abraham. You got any evidence for it? No, I don't have any evidence, but I'm a prophet. Well, yeah, if we, if we believe you're a prophet, then we would have to say, okay, we have to believe what you say. But if your prophethood is in question, if that's what we're trying to figure out, then you saying you're a descendant of Abraham and yet having all these pagan practices... Uh, that weighs against you. So the only evidence we have right now, until Muslims show good proof that Muhammad was a prophet of God, all the evidence we have is against him because the only thing we know about these practices historically is that they were pagan practices. So until Muslims come up with clear proof that they go back to Abraham, we can only assume that these are pagan practices and that therefore Muhammad was not a true prophet because a true prophet is not going to compromise with the pagan practices of, uh, of, of uh, polytheistic Mecca. All right. I just want to, uh, would you have a call? No, oh, I have okay, another so comment. Before you ask a question, <laughs> I just want to add what Brother David said. As far as Christians are concerned, even Jews who are committed to the authority of the scriptures, uh, we cannot accept Muhammad is a son of Ishmael because of the following reason. Uh, according to the Islamic sources, specifically... This was my, going to be my uh, uh, next... <laughs> what, what was it going to be? Uh, Abraham is Chaldean. Hagar, the son of uh, the mother of Ishmael, is Egyptian, so there is any Arabic blood there. <laughs> well, uh, Muslims say that Ishmael wasn't a native Arab. He uh, became, uh, he spoke Arabic, so that opens another can of worms, especially right. when he said he's Chaldean. But his I don't want to get is, into uh, tomb is southern Israel, um, like a little bit of northern Saudi Arabia. Well, he Abraham, was, uh, Ishmael himself, uh, Ishmael? he was buried. Yes. Okay. Well, I didn't know that, but uh, <laughs> he's got new archaeological discoveries. No, that's the uh, Praise the Lord for this guy. Stuff. Isn't he amazing? <laughs> Let me come back to the point where we can be certain. I don't want to go into areas where we're not certain, and I don't want to debate issues that are gray. I want to deal with black and white. Uh, according to the scriptures, if you go to Genesis 21, 21, it says that Ishmael settled in the wilderness of Paran. Mm -hmm. Genesis 21, 21 clearly tells us where Ishmael settled. If you get any good Bible map, you'll note that the wilderness of Paran is located around Egypt and Shur, around mm -hmm. Israel. Mm -hmm. It's not in Mecca. That's clear. Just get any Bible map, you'll see that. Not only that, Genesis 21, 21 goes on to say that Hagar, his mother, went and got Ishmael an Egyptian bride. She went to Egypt and got him a wife. Now, if we follow the reasoning of the Muslims that connect Muhammad to Ishmael, uh, according to their sources, Ishmael himself and his mother settled in Mecca. Once in Mecca, Ishmael married a woman from the tribe of Jurhim. And by the way, this is not found in the Quran. The Quran says nothing about this. This found in the Hadith literature, specifically Sahil Bukhari. And we know that Bukhari is written centuries after the death of Muhammad, over 200 years after his death. Be that as it may, Muslims deem Bukhari to be authentic without dispute. According to Bukhari, Ishmael married a woman from Jurhim. And then Abraham came to visit Ishmael and didn't find Ishmael at home and didn't like uh, this, this wife of Ishmael. So he made a comment and then she reported to Ishmael the comment that Abraham made Ishmael realized that Abraham told Ishmael to get rid of his wife. So Ishmael divorced her. This is according to the Hadith literature. Sahil Bukhari, you'll find it there. So then Ishmael found another woman from the tribe of Jurhim. 
and married her. And then again, according to the same tradition, Abraham again visited Ishmael. Again, Ishmael wasn't home. You would think that Abraham would stick around and wait for Ishmael to return. He didn't. He liked the second wife and pretty much told Ishmael to keep her. So as far as the Muslim sources are concerned, uh, Muhammad is a descendant of Ishmael by virtue of the fact that Ishmael settled in Mecca, married a woman from the tribe of Jurhim, and they became the ancestors of the Quraysh tribe from whom Muhammad sprung. So this is according to the Islamic tradition. If we go by the biblical tradition, we must accept, uh, I'm sorry, reject, let me correct myself, reject the Islamic tradition because it conflicts with the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. The Old Testament says Ishmael settled in the wilderness of Paran, not in Mecca. The Old Testament says that Ishmael's wife was an Egyptian, not from the tribe of Judah. Now again, someone will say, but you see, your Bible's corrupt. The Muslim will say this. And we don't go by the Bible. We only accept those parts of the Bible that agree with the Quran and the authentic traditions attributed to Muhammad. However, you have a problem, Muslims, and here's the problem. If you recall, last night we had a discussion on the Quranic view of the Bible. We only gave some of the men, uh, pl uh, plenty of verses, some of the many verses from the Quran, which sh uh, shows that the author of the Quran and Muhammad believed that our Old, New Old Testament and New Testament were the revealed words of God. In fact, according to the Quran, Jesus confirmed the Torah in his possession, as did Muhammad. If you want references from the Quran, you can go to Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verses 48 to 50. Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verses 48 to 50. Uh, specifically verse 50. Again, chapter 5, verse 46, Surah Al-Ma'idah, chapter 5, verse 46. I want you to note these down and go back and read the Arabic, not just the English, to confirm what I'm about to say. And another reference, chapter 61, verse 6 of the Quran. Chapter 61, verse 6. In all of these passages, it says that Jesus confirmed the Torah between his hands confirm the Torah in his possession, the Torah that he had access to. Historically, we know what the Torah was in the possession of Christ, the Torah that Jesus was reading. Due to discoveries and manuscripts such as the Dead Sea Scrolls, the only Old Testament that Jesus would have been reading and confirming to be the words of God is the very Old Testament that we read today. That's the Old Testament that says, Ishmael settled in the wilderness of Paran and married an Egyptian. So if the Quran is right, that Jesus confirmed the Torah, then that means the Old Testament that we currently read is the revealed words of God, because that's the Torah that Jesus confirmed. If that's the case, then the Hadiths are wrong, which say that Ishmael settled in Mecca and married a woman of the tribe of Jurahim. So I want you to understand the implication of that. If the Quran is right, Jesus confirmed the Torah, and the Torah he confirmed is virtually identical to what we read today. That Torah bears witness against the Hadith and its assertion that Ishmael went to Mecca and married a woman from the tribe of Jurahim. Because the Torah says, he settled in the wilderness of Paran, that's not Mecca, and married an Egyptian. So you have absolutely no evidence that Ishmael and Abraham went to Mecca and built the Kaaba. There is no evidence from the Bible. The evidence from the Bible refutes this assertion. There is no pre-Islamic archaeological or historical documentation that says that Abraham and Ishmael settled there. You only have the testimony of one man, and this testimony comes from a source written over 200 years after his death. And you want us to reject the testimony of the Bible and believe the testimony of such sources. And so uh, what, what Sam has uh, given us is another Islamic dilemma. Because yesterday, Sam gave us a, an Islamic dilemma. In our next program, we're going to see a, an Islamic dilemma. And he's given us one now, where either way you go, there's only two ways to go, and either way you go, you're in trouble. So... The Bible says that, uh, that uh, uh, the Bible tells us where Ishmael went, and it's very different from the Muslim picture. Uh, according to this, Abraham and Ishmael had nothing to do with the Kaaba in Mecca or with any of these, uh, with any of these places. So what we have is uh, if, if the Bible's right, if the Bible's right, then these are all pagan practices. None of them go back to Abraham. None of them go back to Ishmael. They're purely pagan practices. So if the Bible's right, as the Quran says it is, and don't forget Muhammad himself put his hand on a copy of the Torah and exactly. swore that it's the word of God. So if Muhammad's right that the Bible's the word of God, and if the Quran is right that the Bible's the word of God, then Islam is a collection of pagan practices because that's what the Bible says. On the other hand, 
if the Bible's been corrupted and what it says about Abraham and Ishmael and, 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 and what they did, if these are wrong, then the Bible isn't the word of God, in which case the Quran and Muhammad are wrong. And Islam is a false religion. So, notice, if the Bible's right, then Islam's a false religion because it's just a collection of pagan practices. Uh, but if the Bible's wrong, then Islam, once again, is false because uh, Muhammad and the Quran were wrong when it says the Bible's the word of God. Either way, Islam is false. Uh, how can you Muslims deal with this? We gave you, a, a, uh, we gave you an argument like this yesterday. We gave you another argument today. We'll give you another argument uh, later on this evening. Over and over again, we see Muslims have only one of two directions they could go, and either one means that Islam is false. Good evening. Yes. Uh, God bless everybody. Thank you. Uh, what a coincidence, you know, you're talking about this subject, and uh, I'm reading a book by the name of the Sword of the Prophet of Islam by Serge Trifkovic. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in this book, they, he says <clears throat> that Ishmael never went to Mecca. Exactly. Ishmael went only to Egypt, and he got married, and he got two sons. Uh, uh, I don't know about two sons. He had 12 sons, but go ahead. I think uh, probably he got married the first time, and he got two sons. One of them, one of these two sons, anyway... It's not for sure because this guy here, uh, he, he went to the Middle East and he tried to get as much information as he can. But one of these funds, he went to Mecca. Uh, the book I'm reading right now says that... I was looking at... That 490 after Jesus... Uh, there is a prince became the prince of Mecca. His name was Ibn Kalb. And this guy here, he became the prince of Mecca. And he was uh, the chief tribe of Quraysh. And uh, it was Mecca, it was uh, the Kaaba over there. And he was as ritual every year before uh, they go to Al Hajj, what they call. He was washing the Kaaba. And some sources, they said that the black stone, uh, probably some of the Arab tribes, they went to Damascus for trade. They brought that uh, black stone from an area which is south of Damascus. And if you go by yourself over there, you're not going to find nothing but black, uh, black rocks. So 490 after Jesus, it was Kaaba, it was a tradition of Hajj over there, it was a Ramadan fasting, they used to fast for a whole month, you know, before Islam came. And as we know, Muhammad born 570, and he died 632. So 490 to, uh, to 570, it's about 70 years before Muhammad. Uh, there was fasting Ramadan, and there was doing the uh, paganism uh, tradition. So uh, I would like you to emphasize on this subject that whatever tradition the Islam mm -hmm. have, it's not from Islam uh, themselves. It's a tradition it was in the Arabia before Islam came. And thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You want to comment on that or take the you next call? Come, you, okay, let me, I wanted to read some reference on the black mm -hmm. stone he just said. I had said earlier that these are pagan practices, and let me just elaborate. Uh, and these, these are things that even Muslims will admit, but what they will say is that these were practices instituted by Ishmael, and that the descendants of Ishmael then perverted these practices by worshipping other gods. In other words, they'll tell you, yes, the pagans before Muhammad ran around the Kaaba seven times. They would run between the hills of Safa and Marwa, uh, seven times. In fact, according to one tradition, Muhammad's companions hesitated to run between these two hills because initially they used to be two idols, and they would run between the two hills in honor of these idols. Uh, but Muhammad said, no, that's okay, you can keep that practice. And the justification is that these were practices instituted by Ishmael, as well as Abraham, that later on, throughout history, the descendants of Ishmael perverted. Uh, so they'll tell you, yeah, these practices, the pagans performed them. However, they were originally instituted by monotheists to worship the one true God, and these practices were uh, performed in honor of the one true God of Abraham. Like we said, and we're going to emphasize, in fact, we're going to sound like broken records, there is absolutely no biblical, historical, or archaeological proof. Specifically, there is no pre-Islamic proof 
that a Muslim can point to to show that Abraham Ishmael ever went to Mecca. Uh, but I just want to comment on, on uh, the things that Muhammad did, which prove that the God that sent him is not the same God that raised up Abraham and sent Moses with the law. This again comes uh, from an Islamic source. This comes from the history of Al-Tabri. Uh, history of Al-Tabri, which you can actually find in English. This comes from volume 6. And he, he, he mentions an event that while Muhammad was in Mecca, after he claimed to be, to be a prophet of God, after he claimed that Gabriel came and commissioned him, he was running around the Kaaba and kissed the black stone. And I want to read that reference because this kissing of the black stone is sheer idolatry. It is proof that Muhammad was not worshipping the God of Abraham and that the God of Moses did not send Muhammad, had nothing to do with him. But let me read the reference. And I know I think we have other callers, but I think it's important I read this. This comes from the History of Al-Tabri, uh, volume 6, and uh, pages 98 and following. Uh, actually, it's pages 101 to 102. I apologize. Let me read this. Uh, Ibn Humayd, Salama, Muhammad bin Ishaq, Yahya bin Urwa, bin Al-Zubayr, his father, Ur Urwa, and then Abdullah ibn Amr bin Al-As, I said to him, what was the worst attack you saw by Quraysh upon the Messenger of God when they openly showed their enmity to him? And this is from pages 101 all the way 102. I just want to get my references straight. And if I'm mistaken, I do apologize. Our intention is not to give you uh, misinformation. He replied, I was with them when their uh, nobles assembled one day in the Hijr and discussed the Messenger of God. They said, we have never seen the like of what we have uh, endured from this man. Now these are the pagans complaining about the abuse of Muhammad. Muhammad constantly abusing them. We've never seen the like of what we've endured from this man. He has derided our traditional values, abused our forefathers. This is Muhammad, by the way. And what's interesting, Dave, is yesterday we got calls from Muslims saying, you shouldn't be criticizing other religions. You shouldn't be attacking other religions. Just, you know, practice your religion, talk about your own. Here we have an Islamic reference saying that Muhammad constantly attacked, derided, insulted other people's beliefs and values. Look at the reference again. He has derided our traditional values, abused our forefathers, reviled our religion, caused division among us, and insulted our gods. We have endured a great deal from him, or words to that effect. While they were saying this, now note this, this part. The messenger of Allah suddenly appeared and walked up and kissed the black stone. Then he passed by them while performing the circumambulation. Notice at the time where the Kaaba still has 360 idols. There are still, under, still 360 idols surrounding it. Muhammad is running around kissing the black stone during the time where the Kaaba is still in the possession of the pagans. Now how does this prove that He's not a prophet of the true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jack, uh, Jacob, or Moses. Well, according to the scriptures, God expressly forbids. This is in Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 to 5. Read it. Exodus 20, verses 1 to 5. God expressly forbid, forbids making an image of anything in heaven, on earth, in the seas below, bowing to it. In another reference, we see that bowing to an object and kissing it is worship. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 18 says that God will preserve 7,000 Israelites, has preserved 7,000 Israelites who have not bowed the knee to Baal and kissed, kissed him, meaning his image. So kissing an object, an image, is an act of worship. So the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Moses, expressly forbids his followers from making an image and kissing it and bowing to it. And yet here we have Muhammad who is supposedly the prophet of monotheism, a prophet sent by the same God of Abraham, kissing a black stone at a time in which the Kaaba is still in the hands of the pagans, still surrounded with 360 idols, and yet Muslims want us to believe that he is a true prophet who comes and fulfills and completes the message of the prophets before him, uh, prophets like Moses, and so on and so forth. And it, it's, it's interesting. I mean, if you look at like the Old Testament prophets, many of them came during a time when Israel was compromising with paganism. Right. And the purpose of God sending these prophets was to draw them out of that paganism back 
to the worship of the one true God. How, how can you say that Muhammad is in this same line? All of these prophets came to keep people away from paganism. Muhammad comes along and says, oh, all these pagan practices, that's okay. I'll just say they're all from Abraham and that'll make all of these pagan practices okay. I mean, uh, a fake, uh, a false prophet of the Old Testament could have done that. If a false prophet came along and said, oh, you're, you're performing all these practices, you're bowing down to Baal, no problem, Abraham did that too. Any, any, any false prophet could come along and say all these pagan practices are okay. And that would, uh, that would help him a lot with the pagans. Uh, but he's, I mean, think about it. Every single prophet in the line of the prophets of Israel called people away from paganism. Muhammad compromised with almost every aspect of paganism. In fact, I can't think of, of too many instances, uh, ex uh, uh, practices or beliefs of the pagans that Muhammad didn't compromise with. You say, well, Muhammad was a diehard monotheist. He even compromised with that, as we'll see on the next program yes. when we examine the satanic verses. Muhammad compromised with everything, with, every, with practically everything the pagans held. And this is a prophet like the Old Testament prophets? Come on, folks. We'll, we'll take these in reverse. We had two calls. Um, you, Allah is just and merciful. Uh, you, you, you said that th this is a problem. Well, I'd say it is for Islam, but I don't think it's, it's a problem for a being to have uh, an attribute of justice and an attribute of love and mercy, because according to Christianity, God has these attributes. We believe, but we believe that God is infinitely just and that God is infinitely loving and merciful. And how can these not be in conflict? Well, uh, we're going to look at this a bit uh, tomorrow when we discuss the, the reason for the incarnation. Uh, but a just being, uh, a being that is infinitely just, would have to punish all sin. Now, you're right in saying, uh, well, if a being has to punish sin, how can he also be merciful? Well, that is, that does seem to be a difficulty. If you're, you're saying there's a, there's a being who's infinitely just and infinitely loving and merciful, how can, how, how can he be both? If he forgives all sins, if he forgives people because he loves them, then he's not being just. On the other hand, if he punishes everyone for their sins, well, he's not being loving and merciful. And what we find is that if you claim that a God exists with those attributes, you have to have something like the incarnation and sacrificial death of the incarnate Lord. Why? Because if all sin must be punished, then at the end of time, all sin has to have been punished by God. All this sin must have been punished. But if that being truly loves people, he'll be, doing, he'll be willing to do anything uh, to forgive them. And what we find in Christianity is that God loved people so much that he willingly took the, pen took the penalty uh, upon himself. So what we have is that all sin for, in Christianity, at the end of time, every sin will be punished. If a person rejects God's love and forgiveness, then that person has to take the punishment himself. But for all of those who turn to God in repentance, God accepts that punishment on the Lord Jesus Christ. So all sin is punished, and yet God shows his infinite love and mercy by what he did for us. Now, we turn to Islam. Muslims also say that Allah is just and merciful. But in Islam, there's a conflict between them. And what we find is that there's a struggle between uh, Allah's justice and his mercy. And if you're a good Muslim, his, his mercy sort of trumps his justice. And so one of his attributes gets beaten by the other. And then he can, uh, he can accept you into paradise. But what we also find in Islam is that Muslims reduce and diminish and insult God by saying that he's not infinite in his attributes. So think about Allah. According to Islam, at the end of time, has all sin been punished? No, Allah can just sweep your sin under the rug if he really likes you. Uh, so God is not all just because he does not punish all sin. But at the same time, Allah is not all loving and merciful either. Uh, over and over again in the Quran, we find Allah does not love the unbelievers. Allah does not love those who exceed the limits. All, Allah does not love the proud. Allah doesn't love all kinds of people. In fact, according to the Quran, Allah only loves... Good Muslims. Those are the only people that Allah loves. So what we find in what we find in Christianity is that God, since because He is infinite, is also infinite in His characteristics and attributes. But in Islam, uh, God's attributes are limited. So He's a little bit loving towards certain people, and He's a little bit uh, just because He punishes some sin. But this certainly isn't what we uh, what we find in Christianity. So I don't think it's a problem for a being to be. Uh, infinitely just and infinitely merciful, provided you show how those attributes uh, are both exercised in history. 
Uh, you said, were there any predictions about Muhammad? I, I th uh, we talked a bit about this yesterday. There are predictions about Muhammad. According to the Bible, Jesus delivered, uh, delivered a message to his followers. This is the gospel. It's a message that Jesus died on the cross for sins, that he rose from the dead, and that he claimed to be divine. This is the core of the gospel, these three things. We're also told in the New Testament that false prophets are going to come, and they're going to try and corrupt and pervert and distort this message. Muhammad came along. And he seemed to agree with Christians on a lot of things. You Christians believe in God, so do I. You believe Jesus performed miracles, so do I. You believe Jesus was born of a virgin, so do I. You believe Jesus is the Messiah, so do I. There's only three things I want you to deny about Jesus. One, he didn't die on the cross. Uh, two, he didn't rise from the dead. And three, he didn't claim to be divine. Well, any Christian who knew anything about Christianity said, hey, we've been waiting for this. We were told this was going to happen. We've been waiting for you, Muhammad, because the Bible tells us that false prophets are going to come and are going to corrupt this message. Uh, so, one, the, certainly the Bible predicts the coming of false prophets who are going to corrupt the gospel. But second, Jesus tells us that we know a prophet by his fruits. We know a prophet by his fruits. We look at the fruits of just Muhammad and his life. Certainly seemed like a good guy for a while, but what do the, what, when, when the tree fully grows, what do we see from Muhammad? We see a man who's having sex with his slave girls and telling his followers it's okay uh, to rape people. He's enslaving all kinds of people. He's robbing people to support his religion. He's justifying almost every sin you can come up with, and he's proclaiming a heaven that is one big orgy for eternity. Uh, that's, that's what Muhammad came. Now, are these good fruits? Well, according to the Bible, certainly not. So biblically, we're told that prophets would come along like Muhammad, and they're false prophets. Uh, one final prophecy, uh, Jesus said that false prophets come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Muhammad fulfills this prophecy about false prophets more perfectly than anyone else in all of history. How did Muhammad come when he was in Mecca? Peace, tolerance, to you be your religion and to me be my religion. Let's all just get along. He came to the Jews and Christians. Hey, hey, I'm in the same line with you guys. I love you guys. You guys are great. When Muhammad became strong and powerful, all the pagans have to die if they don't convert to Islam. And the Christians and Jews, they have to be subjected and pay us if they just want to survive. What do we have? Come to you, he comes nice and pretending to be loving. As soon as he's in power, the sheep's clothing comes off. So Muhammad, over and over again, fulfills not any prophecies that a new prophet is coming to Arabia who's going to give some new uh, revelation. Muhammad fulfills the prophecies about false prophets who are going to come, corrupt the message, they're going to bear bad fruit, and they're going to be wolves in sheep's clothing. So, yes, there are prophecies about Muhammad, but certainly nothing that supports Islam.